Before I introduce the third speaker, just a quick announcement. 6.15 is the time you should all remember to show up at the entrance of the building so that uh, you can make the, the dinner, um, 6.15, almost right after this. Uh, the third speaker, third and last speaker in our session is uh, uh, Dr. Zhen Yu Wu uh, from NEC Labs uh, in New Jersey, United States. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here and uh, present uh, our research on high fidelity data reduction uh, for big data security dependency analysis. And uh, 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 the majority of the work actually uh, is done by uh, the first author, Zhang Xu, who did an excellent internship and in labs. But uh, unfortunately, due to a visa problem, he couldn't be here uh, with us. So uh, let's get started with uh, some uh, background. And uh, we have heard it so many times. Uh, the cybersecurity attacks are getting nastier and nastier by the year. And uh, there are banks, department stores, uh, online game vendors, and uh, governments, uh, you name it, they all have been hacked. And uh, uh, the secret information has been stolen, and the uh, important services are down. And uh, each instance caused loss of millions of dollars. And uh, compared to the good old days attack where the attacker simply buffer over your web server and put their slogan on the front page and just live happily in five minutes, these uh, attacks in, uh, today uh, have some following characteristics. And first is they normally leverage on more than one attack vectors. And the second is that they uh, carefully chain those attack vector steps together using multi-hop exploration and uh, uh, exploitation. And uh, finally, uh, those attacks are normally uh, persistent and prolonged. Uh, in most cases, uh, the attacker are actually on the victim network for uh, months to years. And uh, these new characteristics of the attack give us uh, some opportunities and challenges. And first, the upside. Uh, compared to the uh, uh, simple attacks, uh, today's attack is complex and therefore uh, early detection and prevention is actually quite possible. And uh, just imagine this scenario. Here is a uh, well firewalled enterprise. And uh, it takes you up and launching some uh, phishing attack, uh, compromise one of the workstation. And relax, it's not the end of the world. But the attacker also just gets started. And uh, through multiple hops of uh, uh, probing and uh, exploration and exploitation, the attacker finally have uh, discovered some valuable asset and uh, achieved their goal. However, uh, this looks like some kind of uh, hide and seek. They have to do all these things without being discovered by you. However, as a defender, we have uh, certain advantages because this uh, game of hide and seek is actually played in your own house and uh, nobody is supposed to know better than your own, yourself about your house. And if we provide, uh, provide us, uh, a pervasive surveillance on the critical places all over the system. And it's quite possible that we can discover those attacks and before the attacker reaches their final goal. And uh, however, there is also downside because of the uh, complexity and uh, of the attack. Uh, normally, when the attack is discovered, uh, quite a bit of compromise is, have, have already done. And uh, a thorough post-attack cleanup is uh, quite a bit difficult. And imagine the uh, scenario we have this five step attack, and somewhere in the middle, a att the attack has been discovered. And uh, what do we do to clean up the attacks? Well, uh, first, we got to have to be able to backtrack the attack steps and discover the point of entry, that broken window, and fix it. Without doing that, the attacker just simply come back. And in addition to that, we have to uh, use forward track to find out all the places the attack have compromised in order to uh, well quantify the impact, as well as clean up all these uh, Trojan horses and the traps the attacker have played. And uh, without doing that, that, the attacker is not really gone from your system. And uh, to, in order to do all this, we have to heavily leverage upon the uh, dependency, attack, uh, dependency analysis. And uh, combining these two factors, it's not uh, that difficult to come up with conclusion that uh, a prevalence uh, a, per a pervasive surveillance is a necessity for uh, the enterprise security. And uh, that is a big data problem. And big data, you may ask why, 
What are those data? Where do they come from? Well, uh, we have to make some realistic assumptions. First is uh, the attack can happen at any time. You cannot just tell attacker, sorry, you are closed. Come back tomorrow. That's not going to work. And second uh, is not all the break-ins are detectable. A lot of those are just zero day or you know, not even uh, discovered vulnerabilities. And uh, some of them are even social engineering, so they're not even possible to be discovered. And finally, is not all the attack steps are malicious per se. A lot of the lateral moves are simply just normal system administrative operations. Unless they are linked somehow with some uh, attacks, then they become suspicious. And uh, with this kind of uh, attack model assumption we have, and uh, the, the best thing we can do is that we, we have to be able to support this uh, on-demand forensic dependency analysis. And this requires uh, several things. First, it requires a detailed system-level monitoring. And you know, there's an old saying that you know, the devil is in the detail. Here, we actually need those details to help us. And actually, the more detail, the better. And second, we have to continuously archive all these data for months to years, just in case you know, the attack has been discovered much later than the point of entry. We have to be able to do all these things. Uh, finally, on top of that, all this data we have archived, they have to be efficiently accessible in multiple dimensions. For example, we have to be able to uh, access data from the point of time and from the, uh, the perspective of uh, the executable name, the characteristic of the file, and for example, the user they have been running, and the network they have been, uh, the IP address they have been touched, all these perspectives, all these dimensions have to be readily accessible at any time. And uh, that is a lot of data to store and to index. And just to give you some uh, realistic uh, word, uh, real world experience, and at ANC Labs America, we have built the uh, ASI platform, uh, which is a pervasive security intelligence collect gathering platform, and with the goal of uh, the uh, automated attack detection and recovery using uh, data, analytics, uh, data analytic techniques as well as the dependency analysis. And our platform right now covers uh, Windows and Linux, and a Mac OS X version is a work in progress. And what we collect is a uh, system core level uh, kernel event data. And uh, uh, from data volume wise, our experience is that the data volume is highly dynamic. Certain hosts generate uh, 10, 20 times more data than other hosts. But on average, we observed uh, per host per day, we have about one gigabyte of data. Well, that number does not look too scary, but uh, the real bottleneck is actually uh, at the data, the data processing layer. And uh, through some rough estimation, we found out that our system is able to, cap, uh, to handle about a 40K event per second. And uh, with about 31 hosts, we have already reached about 800 events per second, which means that our system is uh, only scalable up to uh, 1,000 or 15, uh, 15K of uh, 1.5K hosts. And uh, uh, however, a medium-sized enterprise can easily have uh, 10 times or even 20 times the amount of hosts. And in order to scale up the analysis to that size, we have to be able to scale up the data processing layer to, uh, to support these kind of security analysis. And the data reduction is therefore a quite essential step to achieve this goal. And however, because we're dealing with intricate dependency relationships, there are some requirements that we have to obey. First is, after reduction, the data has to have little impact to dependency analysis. So the uh, classic approach of uh, random or uh, fixed time interval sampling does not really work because that totally destroys the, depend the dependencies among these events. And second is after reduction, the data has to maintain accessibility. So uh, simply just take this database and zip them uh, don't work here. And uh, finally, the, we, have to, uh, we have to have a modest resource consumption. Uh, the reduction itself cannot be the bottleneck. And uh, with that, uh, let's just... Uh, um, just check how, how we're going to do that. First, we have to have uh, uh, understand what is data. And uh, well, the data semantics we have is basically a whole bunch of system objects as well as their inter interactions between each other. And uh, let's say we have a process uh, A, which has certain attributes, for example, the PID, the starting time, and uh, the main executable, the command line, the signature, all these things. 
And uh, we have another uh, object, which is a file, which have some other important characteristics, such as the uh, volume they reside, they reside on, the inode and i generation ID, which which accurately identify the piece of data they're pointing to, and the path name, etc. And then there is an event where the process reads the file. And the event also has attributes. For example, uh, the time it happens and the duration, the actual operation. And uh, uh, for simplicity, here I only uh, I summarize only the uh, dependency, uh, the, the attributes which matters to dependency analysis, which is the uh, information flow direction, the type of operation, as well as the time window. And uh, the process can read, uh, can operate on file uh, more than one time. So there could be multiple edges between these two nodes. And the same process can operate on different files. And meanwhile, there are some other interaction can go on between other uh, objects inside the system. And overall, you can see this uh, becomes a quite uh, heavy uh, r uh, dependency network. And uh, with uh, this network of dependency, actually, we observe that there is actually quite a bit of redundancy. And uh, let's just look at what are these. Uh, for these three file, uh, for these three system objects with all this interaction between them, uh, imagine we're going to try to uh, backtrack this uh, read operation highlighted in blue, and uh, we can see this uh, can easily backtrack to the uh, to write operation which happened before it, as well as the exec operation. And uh, let's draw them on the timeline. And uh, it's not that difficult. We can see that uh, going backwards, the first write and the next exec operation form a uh, shade in time where the second write operation fall into the shade and become shadowed. By shadowed, we mean that, uh, you know, uh, the causality information on this particular event does not uh, impact the backtracking result that much. We can uh, shift it around earlier or later. We can even remove this event. The backtracking outcome will not be changed. And uh, for uh, uh, preserving the maximum of information, uh, we simply aggregate these two events the shadowed events and the key event together as a single event. And uh, similarly, uh, the same argument can be done for the forward tracking, right? This, uh, if you want to forward track the impact of the, this write operation highlighting blue, we forward track to the two read operation happen after it, and then the write operation on the next node. And then the uh, first read operation and the next write operation form a shade of uh, you know, time where the second read operation becomes shadowed and uh, could be merged into a, uh, with the key event in, as a single event. And uh, with this approach, we actually can reduce the causality, uh, reduce the information without uh, hurting the causality. And however, we also noticed some other character interesting characteristics. And uh, there is certain bursty workload in the system which themselves have fairly simple semantics. However, they manifest as a very heavy dependency due to the level of uh, um, monitoring we have. Uh, let me just give you an example. Right, we have observed this uh, particular program, Java program. It uh, performed a read-write operation to the uh, SQLite journal, and then the SQLite database, then back to SQLite journal, and repeat this again, 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 thousands of times, which generates uh, a large amount of dependencies, which cannot be uh, losslessly reduced because their uh, dependencies interleaved between these two uh, three objects. And uh, for that, we kind of uh, borrowed for the simplicity of presentation, we kind of borrowed the, some uh, terms from the online social network study. It's called the EgoNet. Basically, we uh, identify the process, Java, as the center node, and we uh, draw a circle uh, around the one hop dependency, of all, which captures all the nodes and the one hop edges, the, the, the neighbor edges. And then this forms the EgoNet. And uh, although this EgoNet contains quite a bit of amount of information, however, uh, we can simply summarize it as a database update. And uh, similarly, just for another example, we have this process called PCSCD, which uh, performs a read-write operation to many, many, many files on inside the uh, div file system. And again, 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 this forms thousands or tens of thousands of dependencies, which, which cannot be reduced losslessly. However, we apply, we, ap we apply our EgoNet approach, and uh, we, uh, we have uh, this uh, EgoNet, which simply is, you know, can be described as a scan for new device. And this gives us some hint of how we deal with this kind of data. So uh, 
just because these dependencies, although they are very complex, but they are just simply a part of a high level operation. We, uh, we argue that we could simply give up the exact causalities within the ego net. And uh, because whether we have one more or one less nodes or edges among this ego net does not really hurt our understanding of the high level operation. And uh, let me just give you an example how, how our uh, approximation approach works. First, uh, in order to identify uh, whether these two right operation, highlighting blue, is aggregatable, normally we would uh, come try to check dependencies on this uh, uh, previous read operation. However, because of, of our uh, EgoNet uh, approach, we first identify the EgoNet, and we, instead of checking the no edges with, within the EgoNet, we check the edges right outside the EgoNet for the potential aggreg aggregability. And similarly, uh, to check whether this two read operation is aggreg aggregable, we also uh, look at uh, the, um, the edges right outside the EgoNet. And with this approach, we are able to uh, reduce the, uh, a lot of uh, those uh, interleaved dependencies and reduce data. Although it looks like we are throwing a lot of data here, but uh, actually the, our uh, approximation is uh, uh, very conservative. And the error introduction is quite rare and uh, well controlled. And first, we don't have uh, any uh, we, don't, we do not introduce any false negatives because we always enlarge the time window. And the second is uh, if any error is ever introduced, they will never propagate outside the ego net, which means that uh, a maximum one or two hops. And I just give you a, a quick argument. For example, imagine you have uh, uh, this uh, information flow through the network of dependencies. This is the ground truth. And uh, when we apply our uh, dependency approximation, Instead of checking the dependencies within the, the ego net, we check all the dependencies outside the ego net. And we only get, uh, aggregate those edges, which does not uh, hurt dependencies tracking which goes outside the ego net. So if any error is ever going to be introduced, uh, the error will never propagate outside of the uh, one half. And uh, finally, uh, we also found that domain knowledge helps. And uh, it is actually a uh, orthogonal data reduction technique. However, uh, we, uh, our approach is compatible with, uh, uh, with, with this approach. And first, we, uh, uh, we also uh, incorporate uh, the temporary file pruning approach from our previous work, uh, LogGC. Uh, the reason is that uh, the files that are uh, short-lived and read-write only by a single process the data flow generated by those files are just too short to be interesting, and it's quite safe to prune it out without hurting the, too much on our understanding of the backtracking or forward tracking graph. And second, we also discovered a, uh, certain files uh, inside the file system are not uh, regular files. For example, in Linux, we have the proc and sys files, uh, file system. And those files do not normally participate in uh, data flows. Those are just you know, special uh, switches for kernels. And the data you write to them normally do not correspond to the data you read out of it. And uh, as a quick summary, uh, here uh, we have uh, three techniques to reduce the data volume. The first technique is a uh, lossless approach. We systematically discover the shadowed events, and we reduce data by merging uh, them with the key events. And second is a uh, approximation techniques. We uh, discover a uh, burst of workload with very busy EgoNet, and we apply a well-controlled dependency reduction techniques within the EgoNet to reduce data. And finally, uh, we also incorporate a domain knowledge-based uh, uh, data reduction techniques, for example, the uh, system control files and temporary files. And then uh, let's look at how, it, uh, how well it works. Uh, first, for the environment setup, we uh, you leverage on the ASI system deployed inside the NEC Labs, America, and uh, we have uh, about 31 hosts, and we collect one month of trace, which is over 10 billion events. And uh, our workload uh, distribution is uh, just following. Uh, over 90% of the uh, event come from the following four types of uh, uh, workload. The, syst the system monitoring, the daemon, browsing, as well as programming. Uh, the reason why the system monitoring and the daemon actually uh, consist of a, a fairly large portion of the data 
is because uh, our monitoring is 24 by 7, while the people mostly work 8 or 10 hours a day. Therefore, at uh, off hours, uh, those data becomes the majority of data we obtain. And for evaluation target, we uh, look at three aspects. First is the re data reduction capability. We compare this with some uh, naive approach and see how it works. And second, we uh, check the uh, false positive rate introduced by our appro approximation approach. And finally, we look at the resource consumptions. Uh, for the data reduction capability, uh, uh, the graph shows that uh, basically for uh, the uh, lossless approach, uh, we are able to, on average, increase the system processing capability by 2.3 times. And uh, with combining the lossless and the approximation approach, we can uh, improve the system capacity by 3.3 .3 times. And uh, with additional help of the domain knowledge, we can achieve about 4.4 .4 times reduction. And again, uh, due to the difference of the workload, uh, uh, many hosts have uh, a dramatically different kind of reduction uh, outcome than other hosts. And uh, then we compare with the naive approach. Well, uh, for the naive approach, we choose a uh, unconditional, even aggregation approach with a fixed time window. We have two naive algorithms. Uh, first, have a fixed uh, 10 second time window. And second, we have a uh, unbound time window, which, which serves as a theoretical maximum that any algorithm can do. And uh, we have observed, in general, that, uh, uh, let me just summarize the graph for you. Uh, the naive 10 second approach works slightly worse than our losses approach, which works, uh, of course, worse than the uh, upper bound. And uh, for po false positives, we conduct two uh, kind of false positive tests. First, we have a uh, random 20K uh, backtracking test on our big uh, data graph we have obtained. Uh, we uh, apply the backtracking on the data without reduction and the data with the following three re reduction techniques. And we, obtain, uh, we observe that, uh, uh, of course, our reduction technique, uh, our losses reduction techniques, as promised, do not introduce, do not introduce any false positives. Uh, our approximation uh, reduction techniques uh, introduce a uh, moderate amount of false positives. However, in comparison, the naive approach, which works actually worse than our uh, losses, losses approach, introduce a great deal amount of uh, false positives, and which can really hurt the understanding. And uh, we don't even want to look at the uh, upper bound because that totally destroyed the uh, dependencies. And we also evaluate on the uh, uh, on real, uh, backtracking on real attacks. We have uh, 10 test cases. Uh, the first four highlighting red are uh, actual exploits. And the last six uh, highlighting green are actually uh, normal system operations, which could be part of the tech if chained together. And uh, while well, there's a lot of numbers here, uh, but let me summarize for you. So uh, our uh, approximation technique only introduced uh, two uh, false positives in, in two out of the 10 cases. And on uh, each of the case, the po false positive introduced is actually uh, fairly minimum. And uh, likely, it won't hurt understanding of the backtracking graph. So for the resource consumption, uh, our uh, algorithm uh, evaluated works on a single core at 2.4 gigahertz and is able to process about 4,000 events per second. And because uh, the uh, reduction technique works independently on different uh, hosts, Therefore, the, uh, the, 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 uh, sorry. Uh, the, the, our uh, processing capability is linearly scalable. So just add more CPU cores, it automatically become uh, much faster. And for memory consumption, uh, we have about 31 hosts and use about two gigabytes of data, of RAM. And uh, it actually scales sublinearly because we have inter uh, internally implemented a data deduplication techniques. So for example, if uh, the same pass appears in a more than one host. They only use one piece of memory inside our system. So uh, as a conclusion, uh, in this talk, I have talked about uh, the uh, pervasive system surveillance is the future of the enterprise security. And uh, therefore, the dependency analysis needs to be able to scale up to support uh, this approach. And uh, currently, the uh, storage and processing layer right now is a bottleneck. And we introduced the high fidelity data reduction technique, which helps with the uh, throughput. And we have three techniques. 
the quadratic preserved reduction, which is lossless, the process centric approximation, which is uh, lossy but well controlled, and finally, uh, the reduction by domain knowledge. And uh, for future work, uh, actually, there are um, currently ongoing re research in its labs, which not only look at a one hop dependency, but uh, potentially multi hop pattern recognition and summarization in order to reduce, further reduce data volume. And further, uh, di different dependency analysis require different characteristic of data. So it's also possible that we can uh, specialize our uh, reduction techniques uh, uh, against a certain dependency app and achieve uh, much more optimized reduction. And uh, with that, uh, it concludes my talk, and I welcome questions. Any questions from the audience? 